Welcome to Marafaya, the show that dives into the climate crisis in Belize. I'm Andre. And I'm Digna. For today's episode, we will discuss the recent and controversial Gilnet ban that was approved in 2020. To help us better understand the circumstances that brought about the ban, we'll be talking to Andrew Rowe, Chairman of the Coalition for Sustainable Fisheries. The Coalition, along with Oceana Belize, spearheaded a campaign for the Gilnet ban in the 2010s and are providing monetary support for fishers with licensed gill nets who voluntarily gave up their nets once the ban took place in November 2020. So Digna, you fish much? <laughs> Not at all. Like I have this very vivid memory of when I was like five. My dad surprised me with a Barbie fishing rod for kids. And I was so excited. At the time, I used to live in San Pedro, uh, the key, the island. So I was very happy. And, and this little rod was the cutest thing ever. It, it had like its own fish, like toy fish. So I would just like dump it into the puddle and like fish there or go into the lagoon near my house. But actual fishing, I've never done. It's something that my friends and I are always like, oh, we should go fishing sometimes, but never actually got to do. But um, I've seen people that do it and it seems really fun. And I hope that I could one day get to do it. But other than that, I am just glad we have fishermen who provide us with the fishes, with all the goodness to make ceviches, shrimp, conch, all of that. I love seafood. Love. What's your favorite seafood? Uh, fried fish fillet with coconut rice and beans. Nice. It's very basic. No, it's good. I mean, basic is good because that means you can make it for yourself whenever you want it. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm really into big seafood too. Um, I, I can't remember a time in my life when I've not been a fan. Um, I eat all sorts. I think I think my favorite type of seafood, personally, are scallops, um, which you can't really find in Belize. Uh, I tried to buy some frozen ones at Publix last year, and it was perhaps the most disappointing purchase I ever made. Oh, but I, I do like, uh, you know, lobster, fish, conchs, um, all of it, even though I have a mild seafood allergy. Oh, my God. Or shellfish allergy. And uh, it makes my tongue tickle every time I eat seafood. Um, but it's not stopping me. Uh, I, I do fish um, sometimes, though, not nearly as much as I did when I was younger. I, I fish sometimes when I get invited to do some trolling with family members who, uh, you know, have access to boats. Um, and I d- used to do drop fishing uh, when I went to St. George's Key as a kid, right off the pier. And that was... Um, I guess it's a nice, quiet, you know, sort of tranquil childhood memory of mine. Um, my favorite thing to do when it comes to catching fish, though, is I, I like to clean fish, you know, gut them and scale them. And I think maybe that might come off as a bit morbid, but for me, it's really just uh, a fascination with uh, how you process meat in order to make it edible. And it was always interesting to see like the scales of the fish, um, you know, just piling up on a wooden plank and then gutting the fish, you know, getting the parts out of it that we can't eat. And then seeing how, you know, we can transform this animal into something that can give us energy to continue living in one way or another. So I, I, I was thinking about that a lot in the lead up to this recording um, and thinking about how that experience um, must be for other people in Belize who are much more regularly engaged with fishing and depend on it for a livelihood. Uh, as a female, usually I'm the one who ends up cleaning fish when it's brought out of home and I hate it. It's... <laughs> I just I hate it like it uh, the smell the how it feels sometimes I get hurt because I don't know uh, I sometimes a fish slip from my hand so it, uh, no I don't I don't know how <laughs> how you could like that I I think because I never do it at a home right mm-hmm. I'm never doing it in like a clean space it's always outside uh, oh, and you know sense. you just yeah. when you're doing it on a pair you just you know you clean it up and then you just throw everything in the water and then you just walk away with your fish so you know the issue of smells and stuff like that you don't really oh, worry as bo- about about as much sense. That makes sense. and then you know you go you go for a swim and you you get all that stuff off your body um, 
Yeah, so a little bit different. So before we get into uh, the interview with Andrew, we just wanted to give you a bit more information on fishing as it relates to Belize. So fishing can be dated as far back as 2,500 years ago, uh, based on evidence found that archaeological sites um, where the Maya, the indigenous people of Belize once reside, resided. So things that have been found have included manatee bones in coastal areas such as Mahoki, and also oysters, which were perfectly preserved in areas around Altonha. I've never had a Belizean oyster, which is when we, when, you know, you found this thing, I was fascinated by the idea of uh, oysters being in this area. Uh, is that something you're more familiar about, that oysters, people eating oysters in Belize? I just never heard of it. No, I, I, I've seen it in movies, people eating oysters, but not here, and neither have I tried it. So this is something new for me as well. And yeah, I, I, I did this reading, and even now the paper was saying that you can't find oysters like during that time, which was in 1966, um, as much as it was apparently during the time of the Indians, as they used to call it. Yeah, no, that's really fascinating. And um, we got to do some more research into that for another episode. So after that, um, during the colonial period, so then we're jumping ahead, you know, at least, uh, you know, we're going from 2,500 years ago to the 18th century. Turtling, the harpooning of turtles and manatee, became one of the most important aspects of fishing for the colonizers. Turtles were super profitable um, at the time, and it was one of the more famous dishes to take back to London and serve up to, you know, the English gentry. Gill nets began, began to gain popular use in the 18th century because the harpoons that they had been previously using in order to capture turtles would damage the turtle shells and diminish their value. The intact shells uh, allowed the people fishing for these turtles to maintain that value. And um, this is really important. And um, Andrew brings this up later in the interview, how the capture of turtles is one aspect of Belize's colonial past that we have since made a transition away from. And thinking about how heritage mm -hmm. practices um, such as this change over time. And it's, it's also interesting to note that the capture of, of turtles in this way is closely tied with colonization. It's not clear to me based on this whether or not nets were popularly used to capture um, turtles or if turtles were a popular source of food for indigenous Mayas. Um, but that definitely, again, is something that I would like to learn a lot more about. It wasn't until the 19th century that commercial fishing became something that was regularly practiced in, in Belize. Between 1920 to 1960, that's when Belize's fishing industry started to change from a domestic industry to something that was more wholesale with the marketing of lobster, conchs, and fin fish to lucrative markets in the United States and Caribbean. There was a documentary done by Alan Craig in 1966. Sorry, not a documentary, a document published by Alan Craig in 1966. And he quoted, he's quoted as saying in there, throughout most of the colonial period, it is evident that turtles were much more abundant than at present. So already by this time, in the 100-year period between when the colonizers started to go after hawksbill turtles, to 1966, the population of turtles had substantially diminished, and much of that is ascribed to the use of gillnet fish uh, um, because it was a more effective means of getting these animals. So now, catching us up to date a bit more, um, fishing practices have changed along with the development of different technologies um, and those technologies range from things like, you know, now we have motors on boats, which allow much faster travel to fishing grounds and also um, more technology that allows us to know where different species are 
you know, things such as GPS um, and visualizers that allow people to see what is occurring in the water. And then also, you know, changes in the fishing devices themselves, including the use of gill nets. Now we've known that, you know, fishing has been happening since forever, probably. Uh, Now, fishing, as Andre said, it has become a bit more uh, industrialized uh, with the whole globalization of mechanicals, bigger boats, bigger fishing techniques. And fisheries is an industry that is very important globally. Um, It currently employs 59.9 million people worldwide and there are currently 48 4.8 sorry million fishing vessels in 2018 and i mean fish is a delicacy it's very nice apart from the taste it's a very healthy source of meat it has omega-3 fats iodine vitamin d iron calcium zinc all of that goodness so now that we have this whole progress in the fishing industry we have to still be mindful of how much we are fishing so for those who might not know we have uh, something that we call the sustainable development goals now there's 17 of them if i'm not mistaken number 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Now, what is sustainable development? We always, uh, it's a word that is used very often. To me, in a basic way, it's just uh, a way to maintain a practice in a way that it can be continuously done throughout generations, and it won't affect the population of trees or animals or any of that so yeah that's to be able to do something sustainably as to never make it reach to a point where we're like oh shit this is endangered oh shit this is going extinct no we always give it time to produce more and continue with its normal life cycle so it's very important for us to meet this goal so that comes to question is this global fisheries industry sustainable even i even um the food and agriculture organization they called out for effective regulation of fish harvest science-based management plans to restock to restore stock and to end overfishing illegal fishing and other destructive fishing practices and one of those destructive fishing practices is gill nets this is a technique that many indigenous people have been using it throughout the continent of America and maybe even other places of the world. So it's nothing relative new. A gill net, what a gill net is, it dangles from the water surface and are either anchored in a place or allowed to drift. And how it catches food, uh, how it catches the fish, sorry, is that they, when they try to pass through, maybe they didn't see the nets. So then they get caught within when they try to move, like their little gills traps them. But this, these gill nets are nicknamed the walls of death because they are non-selective, meaning they trap even non-target species. Some might claim that um, it's size selective, but that's still um, up to a degree because while they may not be targeting a certain size of fish or a certain species of fish, whether it be large, they will still get trapped. And in them trying to battle and get out of um, out of that trap, they will get injured or they will be taken ashore or in the boat. And then the, the fishermen will realize like, oh no, this, this is not what we want. But sometimes by the time they realize that the fish has already been out of the water for a while they probably have already suffered some injuries they're probably already dead and then they just throw them back in the sea so this is why it's an issue for the environment and the fishing industry so it's there's a really a lot of controversy around this not only in belize but worldwide um it may be an effective way to catch more fish for a lower price and even non- users uh, in other places of the world are um, 
don't like the fact that some people some fishermen are using it because then they get in their way of their catch because they end up get, getting their catch and then they don't have enough so it's both an economical and um environmental problem now thankfully last year well for me thankfully i i see it as a benefit for belize um we joined the list of other countries who have banned gill nets now we'll talk to andrew Rowe, chair of the coalition of sustainable fisheries to find out how the gill net ban went into effect and what the coalition and oceana are doing in order to provide support for those fisher folks who are making the transition away from gill nets to other practices and in some cases other industries i just wanted to jump into our questions here i wanted to know first of all what's your connection to fishing yeah, so thanks, thanks first of all, Andrea and Digna for having me on the show. Um, my connection to fishing goes way back. It's something that I was pretty much born into. I have a family of or my whole family who has enjoyed fishing as recreation. And so from a young age, very young age, from before, as far back as I can remember, whereas Creole say from since I know myself, that's what has been my passion and, and my favorite thing to do when I have free time. So that's, um, yeah, that's, that's what, that's my connection. And it's just blossomed from there. So you've been fishing in all different sorts of forms since you were a kid. That's right. Uh, what's your favorite mode of fishing at this point? Yeah. So I, my favorite fishing, it's kind of fishing. I think for people who do it for recreation is like a drug, you know, once you, once you've had a few good hits, you just can't you can't um, you can't help yourself from, from you can't help yourself from going back for more. And I think when it comes to fishing, at least from my point of view, the my what gives me the most excitement these days is offshore fishing for for big fish such as you know um, blue marlin, sailfish, dolphin, those sorts of things. It's just they're they're very exciting to catch. We don't have the best fishery for those in Belize. Our best fishery are the stuff that you get on the flats, such as tarpon, hermit, bonefish. That's, that's the type of fishing that we're well-renowned for, world-renowned for. And, uh, but to me, still, I just love the, the, the experience of chasing big fish, although I do a little bit of everything. Awesome. So how did that experience with, with fishing, how did that lead you to your current position with the Coalition of Sustainable Fisheries? It's been a very long road, Andre. I, you know... I started out with um, becoming the president of the Belize Game Fish Association back in 2011, which is a position I recently relinquished after, after 10 years. And it was, at the time, I think I was about 21 years old. It was, uh, the association, again, was something I grew up in. My, my grandfather was involved. I, I grew up participating in fishing tournaments. And the time came where they needed somebody to take the helm. And, and I stood up and I, and I did it. And we, the growth continued from there. That was really just the first step. And we started moving into uh, a lot more conservation work because our membership kind of demanded it. And as sports fishers, I think it's our responsibility to do that. So over the years, it, it continually evolved. We started the Coalition for Sustainable Fisheries, I believe in 2018. And at the time, the, or not at the time, still currently, the Belize Game Fish Association is a member of the, of the coalition. And I was asked to be the chair. And I remain on as the chair, even though I'm no longer the president of the BGFA. I'm, I'm their representative there at the coalition. And so that's kind of the a very brief synopsis of, of, the, um, of that kind of, uh, of how it all developed. Yeah, and, and it's very interesting, too, how you mentioned that part about the move to conservation pushed by um, the members of, of that community. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to see uh, when a community can come to recognize why sustainability is integral to, to the continued existence of that very thing they love. Yeah. And in this case, I think where it's, you know, the conversation that we're having or we're going to be having is on gillnets. Mm -hmm. It happened because our membership was feeling direct pain from the impacts of gillnets. Now, Gillnets is a huge topic that we'll, we're going to get into, but the, from the sports fishing point of view, our members are uh, people, for the most part, that, do, that fish recreationally. We do have some commercial fishers as part of our membership, but most of them fish recreationally. And so the little bit of time that they get to, for their free time when they're not working, 
they want to go fishing and when they go out fishing and they see that these gill nets are, are um, destroying the resources that they're targeting, that's where the pain point came in. And that's where we started to get that push from the membership to say, guys, we have to do something. And so we were really acting as the Belize Game Fish Association in isolation, but in connection with a lot of other organizations doing their own thing. And so it was decided, you know what, if we're going to make something happen, we can't just be doing, everybody be doing their own thing. We need to come together and start something where we're all going to work together and we're going to push this thing forward. And that's how the Coalition for Sustainable Fisheries came about. There's been a movement among some to ban gillnets in Belize since the 90s. What about the movement's position during the first peak of COVID-19, uh, no less, allowed the ban to be carried out in 2020, especially since, according to the San yeah, Pedro so, Sun, the phase that was initially um, I guess going to take place in January. The thing to realize is that by the time COVID came in, which would have been you know, the beginning of 2020, this whole gillnet ban was well underway. The work really started truly in, in uh, 2017. And that's when the Ministry of Fisheries at the time and cabinet, or which was led by cabinet, put in place a, a gillnet task force. And what the gillnet task force wa was and intended to do was it was a, a group of all the, the interested stakeholders. So that included, you know, the Belize Game Fish Association was one of the, one of the um, representatives. And I, I, chair, I sat on the, the committee or the task force for sports fishers. There was also um, a large group of gillnet fishers who were involved. So the likes of the Belize uh, Cooperative Fishers Association or the Belize Fishers Cooperative Association, BFCA. There was the Shark Fishers Association. There were several other uh, commercial fishing associations. So the, those who fish mm -hmm. commercially for a living to, to catch fish to sell. Uh, and it was both representatives who use gill nets as well as fishermen who use, who use other um, ways of catching fish. So hand lines, lobster traps, those sorts of things. And then wider than that was the tourism sector, the Belize tourism um, uh, the Ministry of Tourism, sorry, was, was one of the representatives. There was law enforcement. There was the, the um, coastal zone management. It was a very broad group of people. And the intention of the, the task force was to bring all of these stakeholders together to look at gill nets and how they're used in Belize and to limit their destructive uh, capacity on the shared resources that all of these people share. Because, you know, tourism needs it the tourists have to go and, or they want to go and they, they want to go snorkeling and they want to see fish or they want to go diving or they want to go um, fly fishing. And so the fish have to be there. The commercial guys need it because they need to be able to catch fish and sell them for a living. And then the sports fishers, the recreational guys like myself and, and the membership of the Belize Game Fish Association, they need it because that's part of their recreation. And of course, you know, we, we do take some fish home to eat for ourselves. So, this group came together. It worked for about a year as a task force. And this, this, the work involved also a public consultation where they reached out to the public at large, as well as all the, the people within the task force to say, give us what information you have. Give us how Gillnets impact you and let us know, you know what mm -hmm. some of your own recommendations are. I think there were a little over 2,000 responses that came in. They were wide ranging from, you know, basically all sectors of society. There was a lot of student responses. There were a lot of concerned citizens. There were scientific responses. There were fishermen responses. And the end of the day, once we compiled all of this data, it was clear that overwhelmingly, both the, the, the broader society, so people who are just perhaps have an interest in, in conservation and who have an interest in this topic, as well as fishermen, both sports fishermen and commercial fishermen, wanted to see gillnets phased out and ultimately banned. Of course, there were the pro-gillnet side who were there and who supported the, that the, the use of gillnets continued. And so that's from that point, and you know, coming back, Digna, to your, your question about how this ban came about during the pandemic, 
this work was all completed in at the end of 2018 and through 2019, a lot of work was being done to move towards what a phase out would look like. And that involved, um, that involved working with the fishermen, the gillnet fishermen, to understand their position, to understand how a ban would impact them financially, because at the end of the day, this is how these guys make their living. And so there was a lot of consultation with these guys, the majority of whom supported this ban and wanted to come out of gillnet fishing because they said, I don't see a future in this. We see the damage that this fishing is doing to, the, to our ecosystem. And we're seeing that we're catching less and less fish. And we know that this has to stop. If we don't, if we don't stop it now, it's going to be stopped for us in the future, either by law, as it is done already, or we're simply just not going to have any more fish. So these guys wanted to be involved in receiving, they wanted to receive money that we had promised we would be putting forward so that they could trans, transition to some sort of alternative. So how has that money been used for that transition? Because I did read that um, the transition in terms of jobs was to transition them to shrimp farming and also to tourism. So I wanted to know how that's um, been working out over the past year, as far as you know, with those fisher folks who have been able to change uh, with assistance from um, fisheries and the, the deal you all made between yourselves and Oceana as well. Yeah, so... The coalition and Oceana jointly raised $2 million and that was distributed to the to licensed Belizean gillnet fishers. And it, it was kind of a bottom-up approach. We didn't go in and tell them, you know, you're not, you're going to stop gillnet fishing and you're going to start, I don't know, chicken farming or whatever it might be. We said, what do you guys want to do? What do you mm. want to move into? And how can we help? How can this money help build that capacity? And so there's a variety of, of things that they took up. A lot of them, these guys are fishermen. So a lot, they do other types of fishing. None of them solely relied on gillnet fishing. Gillnet fishing was only a part of their income. So a lot of them use that money to reinvest into the other types of fishing that they're doing. So building more lobster traps, refurbishing their boats, buying new engines so that they can, they can do stuff like deep sea fishing. And then there was you know, all sorts of other things that they did. Some of them moved into farming. A couple guys opened restaurants. A couple of them opened meat shops. So they were able to, to sell their seafood produce as well as other, you know, general meat products. So, so far, and we have kept in contact with these guys and we continue to work with them to provide them, provide them guidance. So far, for the most part, it's gone very well and they are all, all very happy with, with how it has gone. I recall that um, there were there were 83 people registered in 2018 with Gillnets and that following the ban, there was uh, attempts to, through advertisements, to um, reach out to these 83 people. Have you been successful in contacting the majority of these people? Yeah, we, we did manage to reach almost all of the 83. What, trans, what transpired in between, you know, this uh, or during this whole process is that we found out that a large amount of these fishermen, these 83 fishermen who were licensed with gillnets were actually citizens and or residents of Guatemala. They were not Belizean. And so these guys would come to Belize um, for short periods of time with a Belizean fisher license and they would fish in Belize's waters and then they would, most of them would take their produce back to Guatemala to resell and then some of them would sell in Belize. And so in 2019, a statutory instrument was passed that required uh, a person applying for a license, a, fishery, uh, a commercial fishing license to be a citizen of Belize, as well as resident within the country for at least six months. So that right away kicked out all of those people who were essentially Guatemalan fishermen fishing under Belize, Belize licenses. And that was roughly 30 people or so. Uh, we were able to contact almost everybody. There were a few that we were aware were living in Guatemala and we did still make attempts to contact them, but they were, they were simply unreachable and we still to this date have not heard from them. I would like to know what organizations are involved in monitoring the Gilnet ban? Okay, so monitoring, I guess, would be the fisheries department and the ministry. So they are... Uh, I guess from a point of view of monitoring, they are aware of the, the people involved in the transition process. They are 
also the ones with the legal responsibility and the legal remit to enforce the fisheries laws. And I think they, despite the immense challenges that the fisheries department faces, especially now with budget cuts and, and all of that, which they, you know, they already struggled with limited budget beforehand. They do try hard to enforce the laws and that is, they receive additional support from the likes of the Coast Guard who do also enforce fisheries laws where they can. And there's also what are called co-managers of our different uh, marine protected areas. So in the south, there's, um, there's a Toledo or a Tide, which is uh, um, one of the co-managers for the Port of Honduras Marine Reserve. There's C, uh, Southern Environmental Agency, who manages the, the, um, manages the, uh, the Gladden Spit, Silk Keys, all of those kind of marine reserves down south. There's TASA, the Turner Fatal um, Sustainability Association. These guys are, uh, they work very closely with the fisheries department, but they're, they're privately funded. So they're able to help out with the enforcement as well. From the point of view of working with the fishers, Oceana and the Coalition for Sustainable Fisheries is still working very closely with these guys. Oceana's money is actually being given out over the course of a 24 month period. And so once a month or every month, at the end of every month, these guys are receiving a lump sum of money from Oceana and the coalition's money was used kind of as a, as a single payment, uh, a large payment for investment into their new ventures. And mm -hmm. the idea is that the money from the coalition helps them get started in these new ventures. And over the course of that, you know, two year period, Oceana's money is kind of a, a income replacement so that these guys having given up gill nets and working on a new investment, they're still given some kind of subsidy to make sure they have some money in their pockets to continue, you know, paying their bills and living their lives um, comfortably. Yeah, it's really great to hear that um, these fishermen weren't abandoned within the process and it's something that's still ongoing. So as for us to provide help for them into this transition, uh, However, there were some fishers resistant to the ban, right? They argued that the gillnet is part of fisher folk cultural heritage and that their scale of gillnet use is artisanal that should not be abandoned. Uh, was this true based on your discussion with the fishers? So, you know, there's a lot of things that I think people can say is cultural. Um, you know, it was cultural at one point, Digna, for Belizeans to consume sea turtles. So hawks, bill turtles, um, green turtles, those sorts of things. Those turtles are now endangered and they have been placed on a, a protected species list. Now, I think that was done, I can't recall, but I would think that the, I think it was either in the, in the 90s or the early 2000s that protection was given to those species. Manatees were consumed in, in the, uh, back in the, in the colonial days, if you look through some of the archeological, archeological reports that are provided from archeological digs done out at St. George's Key, which was our original settlement, it's very common for them to un unearth manatee bones. Now that was cultural at one point, but we realized that these things are no longer sustainable and cannot be accepted any longer. Likewise, yes, gillnets are a big part of, especially in Southern Belize, they were part of the culture. Gillnetting started in the 50s and the 60s when access to outboard engines was simply not possible. People didn't have boats of any kind of scale. So they were using basically dories to go out and they'd set a little net, a small net, artisanal as you, you know, the phrase that you use, right along the coast and they'd be able to catch enough fish for themselves to eat and then probably to share amongst the community and possibly sell a little bit. But with the introduction of, of you know, faster boats, larger engines, more productive and more high-tech fishing equipment, get the use of gill nets is no longer artisanal and has become commercial and is something that cannot in its, far, in its, in its previous, I can't say current state because it's now banned, but in its previous state, could not have been continued without severe environmental impact to fish species, as well as to, to the likes of manatees and sea turtles. And so, yes, I, I, I accept, you know, that at one point, yes, it was cultural and artisanal, but today that has changed. And in order for us to make sure that this stuff is there for the future, 
we have to change and we have to change our mentalities and we have to change the laws that govern how we how we fish yeah and that perfectly leads to my next question which is you're talking about people having to change their mentality and i agree that is something on a more general level with regards to environmental issues we i think we we need to be doing um what are some more concrete things you think that the general public should be attempting to do or trying to practice with regard to sustainable fishing I, I love that question, Andre, because I think one of the big things that, that people have been talking about is the, the Netflix recent, or you can call it a documentary, but Sea Spiracy, which is something that everybody seems to have seen. And I was actually just having a conversation with one of my friends about the merits and, the, and how accurate it is. And to me, I think at the end of the day, the importance or the effect of, of something like that is that it's raised the awareness of people to see that, you know, I love eating fish and I'm going to happily go to a sushi bar and eat tuna and salmon and crab and never really thought about where did this stuff come from? Now asking, you know, what can people do? I think that is the most important thing that somebody can do. When you go to the fish market, just talk to the fisherman and he'll tell you, boss, where did, how you catch this fish? And he'll most likely tell you, you know what? I had to work hard and I catched it for a hand line. And, and, you know, that's a sustainable type of fishing. When you see, again, when you're, when you're purchasing seafood, Belize is very lucky that we, we produce most of our own seafood. We import very little other than some tuna and some salmon and stuff like that. But look at the fish and say, you know, is, does it make sense for me to buy a little four inch tiny little snapper because it's good Friday? No, it doesn't. You know, ask, make sure that the fish that you're buying, the seafood that you're eating is sustainably caught. Make sure that it's of a size that, that makes sense. We shouldn't be eating tiny little fish because they haven't had the chance to get big and to reproduce and, and provide for, for more fish to be there. So that's my biggest thing to people is just find out where does your seafood come from and make sure that it was sustainably caught to the best of your ability. And of course, educate yourself wherever possible. Is there a resource that you can um, share with us or send to us so that we can share with our audience in terms of, um, one thing I'm always curious about, you referring to size of the fish. And uh, I think for people who are maybe not as proficient with fishing or, or experienced, uh, that might be something that is a little bit more unclear. Uh, I think it would be really helpful if, if we had a little bit more information on uh on like a visual guide as to what is considered um, healthy sizes to be purchasing for different species. I don't know if there's something like that, but uh, I would love to see it. Yeah, what we can do is we can try and dig up some information for you guys. I can also say that, that the Belize Game Fish Association has recently engaged the fisheries department because this is a, an important topic. Again, me as a, as a sports fisher, um, and I go out on the weekend, is it right for me to go out and catch, say, 100 pounds of, of snapper and take it home and sell it? I'm not licensed to do that, nor should I be doing it since that's how people make their money. Likewise, the guys who are doing commercial fishing, is it right for them to go and catch any and all fish that bite their line? I don't think so either. There needs to be some kind of regulations, size limits, species limits, those sorts of things. So this is something that we've recently engaged the fisheries department in. And we're hoping, you know, over the course of these things take, you know, years at times, we hope to develop some kind of, of standards and, and hopefully eventually laws for Belize that people can follow so that when they buy fish, it's, you know, reasonable, it's reasonable to believe that this, this fish was the right size and caught sustainably and it's okay for me to be eating it. I'm not killing our reef by having a, having a fry fish for lunch. Thank you for that input. Honestly, as uh, someone who eats fish, sometimes along the highway, I would see uh, fishermen selling fish and it's always like small. And in my head, I don't purchase them because I think, oh, it's not fully um, grown. I just think it's less meat and I don't want less meat. I want something with, with more meat. But it's totally now something that I also will take into consideration moving forward. So thank you for that insight. Um, I have one other question. So what is next for the coalition now? The coalition, I think what we're trying to do is it's not, I, I don't think it would ever be fair for us to simply chuck a million dollars at these guys and say, best of luck, see you later. We're trying to make sure that these guys successfully transition through this process, that we're there to support them. 
and make sure that this is, you know, that at the end of the day, we can hang our hat and say, this worked, we did a good job for a lot of reasons. One, because I think it's owed to them. You know, when I, I sit here, I'm sitting in an office where every day I come to work and I get paid a salary, but these guys have to go out no matter if it's raining, no matter if the sun's beating on their back, no matter how rough it is, that's how they make their money. And so it would not be fair for, for us to just sit here and pull their, their a line of income from them and simply walk away. So we're trying to make sure that this thing is successful. And of course, too, that it's, it's legally cemented at the moment. It's, it's being done. The ban has been put through by way of a statutory instrument. There's still some things that we think could be improved by way of, of um, better legislation. So we're still working with the, fishery, the Ministry of Blue Economy to try and make sure that this law is cemented permanently in our books or as permanently as any law can possibly be so that we can, you know, be satisfied that this has been successful and we can walk away. After that, I think the big thing is for, for us as the coalition is to make sure that there is some enforcement. As I mentioned, the, the fisheries department really struggles with, with resources for enforcement. And so we're going to see what options are on the table to try and help with that problem because you know it's all well and good to have laws on the books, but if there is nobody out there enforcing them, especially in the sea, which is extremely, extremely wide and, and, and void of many of people, you know, people can really do what they please out there. So that's our big thing at the moment. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Andrew. We, we really appreciate the time and all the insight you're able to provide us about uh, sustainable fisheries and the, and the current Gilnet band. Sure guys. Well, I really appreciate the time and, um, I, uh, I look forward to, to hearing how, how um, successful this podcast will become. Uh, thanks to Andrew for coming on the show to talk about the Gilnet ban and how that went on. Um, it has me thinking a few things. I definitely agree that the Gilnet ban was necessary given the impact it was happen- having on um, fish stocks and the viability of uh, long-term fishing industry in Belize. But I also think there's more need for us to talk about these transition points. As Andrew mentioned at the end of that interview, he spoke about the fact that there, this is another moment in which Belize is making a change from a practice that has in some ways been considered to be part of the culture of Belize. So he said, similar to how we have abandoned the practice of capturing hawksbill turtles due to how that practice put them in danger of extinction, we also need to be thinking about how a cultural shift in this practice is intended to make a more dramatic shift towards sustainable fishing for Belize's long-term survival. It reminds me of how beef consumption needs to dramatically change as well, because its consumption and the need to have more um, cattle is one of the major drivers of deforestation, as well as methane emissions. But that making this change is also something that's culturally contentious, because it in some ways feels like it would be infringing on somebody's opportunity to consume what they want in a way that they would like. So this all leaves me with the question of how do we create opportunities to sustain people's sense of cultural continuity amid the fissures of ecological disruption? In other words, how do we make people feel as we make changes to adapt to a changing climate and a more disruptive ecological world, how do we make those changes with people in mind, with the with frontline communities like these fisher folks who feel like their opportunity to make money in the ways that they've long practiced are now being changed and not changed by their own design, but changed due to a ban that in some cases feels like it's coming from people with greater access to money, greater access to opportunity. And 
I guess there's also the element of of class that we are not really talking about here, which is that this is another instance in which some people who feel like they are typical of the ones making less money within an industry are being told by people in greater positions of authority or money that they must alter their behavior. When in truth, you know, um, it is the wealthy that of the world that have led us to the climate crisis through their consumption. And there's not really yet much of a push for those people to be held accountable and for those people to make a change. So maybe that's something else we need to be thinking about is how do we make these sort of transitions more equitable so that those at the top are being asked to make changes to an appropriate degree, just as they are expecting those at the bottom to do so as well. Yeah, Andre, I totally agree with you. Like that's something that has been on my mind for quite some time now, because you know it's easier said than done, right? We can always say, "Oh, this is the solution. Why don't we just do this?" But it it's more than just that. Um, like you said, this is a problem the wealthy led us to, because uh, with the meat consumption, the beef consumption that you mentioned, um, relative to, like the size of Belize, right? Uh, we don't have any franchises. We don't have big shops that we, we don't have a, a Burger King. We don't have a McDonald's, like those places that um, their main profit or income comes from beef burgers. So now if we say, oh, let's just stop eating um, beef or let's reduce our consumption of beef, I think that would be a bit selfish because we're not taking into consideration. I mean, please, we don't, relatively we don't co- contribute much to this issue and most of us like our beef they're probably from home like the farmers you know we have a lot of farmers so it's more of a finding a solution that would be relevant to our population because even me I I mean I don't eat beef often I eat it every once in a while and I don't think I can just go vegan <laughs> and that's one of the main solutions uh, mm-hmm. people are trying to give like just go vegan but it's not that easy it, it it will be a way to um limit people culturally as well especially those who depend a lot on on meat so the, it, it's something that's always bothering my mind like we always say this is the solution but let's be real uh solar energy it's cleaner how much does it cost to install solar energy panels in the home? Uh, anything that's eco-friendly, anything that's sustainable, it's far more expensive. Uh, that the common people really, we really, so like they won't. They're not thinking about long term. It's going to save them money. They're just thinking, right now, I need this. It's cheaper. I'm going to get this. So we really have to try and think of solutions that most of the population it's achievable for most of yeah the and would be supported by them too right um i like that you talk about solar there as well because in addition to the cost of solar another thing we have to be thinking too about is that solar panels um they similarly face issues of requiring precious minerals for their their production um and those precious minerals are often in places that are very poor, where the poorest among among those populations are required to do that work. Um, similarly, in the case of like lithium batteries, you know, um, Bolivia is considered to be the country in the world with the biggest um, stock of lithium, uh, which has made it a contentious area at this moment in which the climate crisis is um, pushing for renewable energies, um, but is unwilling to do so in a way that acknowledges the exploitation that can still occur under these new energy infrastructures. Yeah, I think we should save this for like a yeah. whole episode. <laughs> totally, totally. I, I definitely want to talk more about um, about all this. So yeah, we'll 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 save it for another time. But uh, you you took us there, Digna. So I blame Sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I, I'm I'm glad to be talking uh, solar. 
So for our next episode, we'll be discussing increased in humidity brought about by global warming, the possibilities for Central American countries to survive further increases, and talk to Dr. Giselle Topsy about how heat impacts our health and what we can do to mitigate those impacts. If you like the show, please consider writing a review for us over on Apple Podcasts as it helps to increase the show's visibility. If you write a five-star review, we will read it in a future episode. If you have a climate crisis or environmental story impacting Belize you like discussed, you can contact us at M-A-D-A-F-Y-A-H at gmail.com or message us on Facebook and Twitter at Marafaya. And be sure to be following us on them. We encourage you to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to the podcast so you can hear all of the other episodes that we have coming up in the next few weeks. Thanks to Alexander Evans for providing our theme song. You can find him on IG at Alexander Evans Music. And thanks to Demi Williams for providing our artwork. And thanks to you for listening to this episode. We wish for you greater resilience, peace, and moments of quiet. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.